can start with that. Okay. Uh, welcome to the webinar on fecal sludge treatment in rural areas. Uh, whether urban or rural convergence work, this is the main focus of our webinar. We are joined together by eminent speakers from Asia and Africa, and we are also joined by participants from Asia and Africa. Now that so many toilets have been built, what are the issues that are coming? We should first discuss this. Now, uh, I would uh, like to say that CAC researchers have traveled across different states of India with different hydrogeological conditions not only in India, but also in different parts of Asia and Africa. And we have seen that the most preferred twin pit with honeycomb structure, which is preferred for on-site treatment of fecal sludge in rural areas is absent in many places. And instead of that, we have found that single pit deep pit toilets or faulty septic tanks, which we call the holding tanks have been constructed. In many places, it is just a hole in the ground. So the main question now is what happens to the huge amount of untreated sludge which are not treated in situ? So are we dumping it on the open spaces or water bodies? Again, that can pollute our water sources, our soil. We all know the whole world is going through a pandemic and the pandemic has taught us that washing hands with the clean water is the least we can do to fight the virus. In global south, whether we are talking about India, Africa or any part of South Asia, we have seen that around 70% of the population, they live in the rural areas. Hence, it is very important to take care of the rural areas, the fecal sludge that is coming out, the untreated fecal sludge that is coming out from the rural areas to meet the sustainable development goal on safe sanitation. Now, the untreated sludge that is uh, created now needs to be treated off-site. We have to find out ways, but how? Are we then talking about fecal sludge treatment plants? for cluster of villages, single village. How expensive are these plants? We have experts from Orissa, we have experts from Bangladesh who can talk, give us some insight of how expensive these fecal sludge treatment plants are there. Or are we talk, uh, talking about carrying the sludge from the nearest treatment plants to treat the sludge of the rural areas in the urban areas? where treatment plants have been created in the urban areas. Because we already know that in urban areas, whatever treatment plants are created, they are underutilized. So are we also thinking of tagging the cluster of villages with such plants? Now, <clears throat> if we are thinking in that line, what is the MOU that has to be signed between the uh, cluster of villages and the urban local bodies. Who are the parties who are going to sign this uh, MOU? What, what should be the key features? And who are the key stakeholders? What are the financial implications? These are the focus of today's uh, discussion. So with this, I um, actually um, request my colleague Swati uh, to give us some insight of her findings in the states of Orissa and Chhattisgarh. Swati, can you please take over? And then we will have um, uh, Mr. Parmeswaran B, who is the director of from the state of Orissa and where formalized MOUs have been signed between cluster of villages and urban local bodies to take care of the rural fecal sludge. So Swati, can you please take over? Then uh, Mr. Parmeswaran can give a better insight of the state of Orissa. Uh, there is a okay. uh, So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Parmeshwaran, sir, Lamu, sir, and Abdul 
Abdullah sir. Uh, I bring to all of you uh, CSC's experience uh, in Orissa and Raipur that we visited uh, uh, almost a month back. I would not be talking much in detail because I think Parmeshwaran sir would be the right person uh, to explain everything in detail, but I would just quickly uh, take you all through uh, my our experience as an organization. So uh, to start with, uh, states have been declared ODF. Uh, every household in the rural India has been provided with a toilet in the Swachh Bharat Mission Grameen phase one. And now we have moved into the phase two now where we are looking into retrofitting and safe management and disposal or reuse of fecal sludge. So was it, what is it that we need to look into? We need to look into sustainability and affordability. Sustainability is something that is going to take us, you know, uh, uh, in the long run. So, uh, you know, what, what is it, uh, you know, whether rural FSTPs will help us? Are they actually needed or are they feasible? Or, uh, you know, as the Swachh Bharat Mission guidelines propagate clustering or urban convergence is the solution. Whether is it feasible? If yes, where? If no, why not? And is the community accepting, uh, accepting the convergence part? And what are the legal and financial modalities that go into it? Which of these solutions is more sustainable? And what are the states thinking about it? These are the few questions that we had in our mind when we started our research. Because uh, 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 you know the basic experience uh, across states that we had, most of the uh, most of the states have single pits which are not of uniform size. Even the twin pits and septic tanks are not made as per the design specifications. Uh, rural households are not interested to spend money on retrofitting, and uh, retrofitting is also not possible in all the cases. And in that case, we need to provide them with fecal sludge management solutions. Apart from that, we have been also interacting with urban FSTP operators. They often venture out to the nearby rural areas in search of markets because they are not getting enough sludge uh, to make their operations sustainable and uh, a lot of their capacity remains unutilized. So, uh, you know, Swachh Bharat Mission guidelines have also been, uh, you know, uh, telling uh, before we construct new rural FSTPs, we need to look into utilization and convergence with an existing urban capacities. So because of this, we uh, organize a lot of online workshops and webinars during the COVID times. And we asked and interacted with the officials and professionals in the field about what next, what are they thinking about it? And we found out that the two neighboring states, Odisha and Chhattisgarh, have already piloted and formalized the process. And now they are already looking forward to upscaling it. So we moved to uh, Orissa and th they had uh, two big pilots already successfully done. One was in Dhenkinal and one one was in Balasore. And uh, you know, behind following the lead was Raipur Durk, uh, where they had an F uh, uh, FSTP uh, with convergent, convergence model installed. So we went to both the places to uh, understand uh, what uh, what are the uh, from, uh, modalities, uh, you know, what all it took to the states to uh, legalize it and make it binding. So I uh, start with Dhenkinal, but I would just quickly brush it through because Parmeshwaran sir is here and he would be the right person to let us all know how they did it and what are the challenges that they face and how did they succeed eventually. But uh, they started with Dhenkinal. Uh, and in coordination with CPR and UNICEF, this, the state surveyed uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Dhenkanal district. They chalked out plans for all aspects of solid liquid waste management. And using GIS tools, they chalked out a 10 kilometer radius and they identified 17 gram panchayats where they would legalize uh, the urban rural convergence model. Then they organized the capacity building workshops and exposure visits for those gram panchayats. Uh, gram panchayats. And then once it was all done, they entered into a legal uh, you know, binding agreement. They signed MOUs with uh, each gram panchayat with, and, and the ULB. The MOUs uh, detailed out all the roles and responsibilities, the financial commitments, the standard operating procedures, et cetera, uh, you know, in, in, in detail. And once uh, you know, the state is exhausted, uh, you know, once the state is able to chalk out a plan for the convergence, they would then look into the other models where they may eventually uh, venture out for cluster FSTPs or 
you know, uh, Parmeshwaran sir would probably be able to better explain about it. So these are a few pictures of the Dhankanal FSTP. Uh, the FSTP is in the urban areas. It was being, it, uh, it was made for urban, but uh, the capacity, majority of its capacity was unutilized. And now it is nearing the saturation capacity because, uh, because of the services being provided and the new market that they explored in the rural areas. I would quickly just brief you with the MOU uh, clauses which they had. So uh, they, the first MOU that they signed was between the ULB and each Gram Panchayat. So they had 17 agreements signed with the ULB and where ULB was asked to provide similar services as they, as they provide to urban areas. They had to provide vehicles on demand. They had to raise invoices. They had to address the complaints and they had to address uh, the safety of sanitation workers as usual. While the Gram Panchayats were responsible for undertaking the surveys, they had to monitor desludging uh, uh, activities, they had to maintain all the records, they had to spread awareness, and they had to pay the invoices every month and raised by the ULB, and they had to recover the cost from the households and also help the households to uh, place a request, desludging request. Uh, the second MOU basically was an addendum which was signed with the uh, self-help groups. So this FSTP is majorly being operated by the self-help groups uh, because it is a low-cost model FSTP. Uh, so SHGs have been operating it and they were asked to extend similar services to rural areas and ensure timely delivery of services and raising of invoices. And what more to it? We were eager to understand that, are there any more uh, legal formalities that are required to be done? Uh, before I move uh, ahead, I would just uh, we would just uh, uh, just brief you about the financial model that uh, then Kenal uh, chose to work on. So once the MOUs were signed and uh, a legal proce uh, a formal procedure of uh, uh, demand uh, addressal was started, uh, the households were supposed to go to panchayats for with their with their request for the sledging vehicle. The panchayats would coordinate with the Dinkanal FSTP and place an appropriate uh, request and uh, the costs could be covered by Gram Panchayat uh, through uh, a prepaid model or uh, maybe in installments. And then they issued a receipt uh, as per the Form 7 Arisa Gram Panchayat Rules 2014. Uh, this receipt was uh, collected by the desludging operator and submitted to the SHG group operating the vehicles at the Dhankanal FSTP, which would basis these receipts uh, raise monthly invoices to which the Gram Panchayat had to uh, transfer the money electronically by month end. So uh, 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 just a few highlights of how, how this initially worked because uh, they had, uh, the community was sensitized, there were exposure visits done. Initially they provided a few services and then once the, you know, uh, the community was sensitized, uh, they were ready to pay in a prepaid mode as well. The state had issued a letter uh, basis differential uh, service charges for 10, 15, and 20 kilometers basis, which the, the, the rates was decided for the rural areas. So they had differential rates for 10, 15, and 20 kilometers, uh, which consisted of the base price, which the municipality charges, and the fuel price. And now the canal has uh, increased the circumference to 20 kilometers, and they have 49 more gram panchas added for the Dhankanal FSTP only. Uh, they, uh, the Balasor mod model was also working on a similar, a similar uh, uh, basis, but this uh, uh, was an urban FSTP made on rural land. And uh, it, was, it was a 60 KLD FSTP while they were re receiving only 30 KLD of sludge from the urban areas. So they, they were eventually venturing out informally in the nearby rural areas for sludge. But once uh, a formal letter was issued from the state, they formalized the entire process and now they are re receiving an additional 17 uh, KLD of sludge from the rural areas and, the, and they are still expanding. Here, uh, the additional MOU which was signed was the private, the private players because there were a lot of private players in the area. So they uh, registered them, they, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they had a GPS monitoring installed inside their vehicles to ensure that they do not dump the sludge elsewhere. And the private operators were also made to pay a certain tipping fee to ULB as a charge for dumping the sludge in the treatment plant. So uh, we also had a similar experience with uh, Durk Kumari Nagar Palika. The FSTP was made on Kumar Nagar Palika land, but the FSTP was planned with five gram panchayats and the Nagar Palika but they are yet to start their IEC awareness activities. It's, it's in the inception phase and still they have a long way to go. So uh, we, do not, we, we do not have much 
uh, knowledge on the kind of MOUs they would do about it. Uh, so quickly talking about the convergence, what we learned is uh, what will this convergence achieve? Uh, it ensures that the service is available formally on daily basis on demand. It brings a legal binding to the rural areas and urban areas both. There are proper demarcation of roles and responsibilities because of this formal, because initially uh, only those people who were aware and had money were availing the services in rural areas. But this formalization has actually created awareness and uh, more and more people. This has created a better market. There's, there, there's, they have created a better database and it ensures timely em emptying of the pits. And this will help us to estimate requirements and plan FSTPs only where it is necessary. New market opportunities have opened up for the urban investors because their confidence will increase eventually. And lastly, we can learn from the mistakes. We can develop uh, from the skills and from the skills and capacities of the rural urban areas. Sorry. So uh, ending, we this is this is these are few solutions that we had uh, for uh, for the for for the states. Uh, retrofitting of solution has to be done on the case to case basis. We have to decide. We leave it uh, up to you to decide. You know what is better, rural FSTP or convergence. However, we prioritize convergence uh, because convergence would mean sharing of the resources and finances both, and we can develop better solution with the urban experience. However, we have to have a area specific cost sharing model developed for sustainability, and we also need to have proper ICs uh, and awareness generation to develop a. Uh, proper market for sanitation services in rural areas. Thank you so much. Thank you, Swati. So <clears throat> I request Mr. Parmeswaran, Director of uh, Rural Water and Sanitation, uh, to actually uh, give us the insight because they are the first state to actually formalize this process of urban rural convergence and they are leading in India. So I would request sir to actually uh, focus on this and let us know um, how uh, sustainable is this model and how actually they brought in the changes. Over to you, Mr. Parmeshwar. Uh, thank you, Sushmita. Respected Dr. Abdullah, respected uh, Mr. Alveni. Uh, Swati, all other dignitaries who are participating in the uh, virtual workshop today. A very good afternoon to all of you. I believe it's still good afternoon in Uganda or it is good evening, I'm not very sure. Uh, anyway, so uh, coming to our topic today of what exactly is the uh, convergence model that we have adopted in Odisha in India. Uh, Odisha is a relatively... Uh, I would say not a very prosperous state in uh, India, given the uh, economically, uh, it is slightly below the national average of India. And it has predominantly uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, people living in the state. In fact, about 45% uh, of the people here in the state have uh, underprivileged background. And the state is hugely covered by forest and the villages are very dispersed. Given this challenge, the rural areas, this is one of the states where we have about 50,000 villages for a population of 85 lakh households, which are there in the rural areas. Therefore, it is very clear that uh, the households are much uh, spread out and even the so-called villages have multiple habitations, whereby people are staying in clusters. Given this challenge, when we were looking at uh, ensuring sanitation for the fecal sludge matter, we were having internal discussion as to how to go forward. Thanks to Government of India's uh, uh, visionary uh, project, Swach Bharat Mission Phase 1, which was driven by the Honorable Prime Minister from 2014 to 2019, we had uh, toilets built in almost all households of the rural India including Odisha. However, initially when the Swachh Bharat Mission Phase 1 was launched, in the first one, one and a half years, there was no mandate that a twin pit toilet has to be constructed. It was uh, just that a toilet has to be made. It was uh, therefore, by and large, initially, the toilets that were constructed were single pit toilets. However, subsequently, government of uh, India insisted that there should be twin pit toilets that should be made. 
therefore even the online reporting formats etc got accordingly modified however given the technical requirements for constructing a twin feet toilet there were few challenges on the ground and uh, as swati had pointed out there were many locations despite our best intentions we could not build the twin feet toilets or even when the twin feet toilets were made in some cases the y junction with the proper uh, uh, switching between both the uh, pits were not properly done therefore what is officially about 20% of a septic tank and a single pit in the uh, rural areas we believe it could be more in numbers beyond this 20% also therefore it becomes necessary that we provide some kind of uh, fecal sludge management to these single pit toilets as well as septic tanks which are present in the rural area now how do we do that there are two options in fact the guidelines of swachh bharat mission phase 2 initially suggested that uh, we could make a uh, fecal sludge treatment plants at the rural areas also however we consciously decided that we will be taking up convergence with the urban local bodies for two reasons first is the uh, push factor that is the grama panchayats today have only one single a uh, person called panchayat executive officer who is maintaining all the records and taking care of several activities in the grama panchayat therefore to create a fecal sludge treatment plant even for a cluster of grama panchayats let us say 15 20 grama panchayats and how do we manage it and who will be managing it that becomes a bigger question secondly is the pull factor we have 114 urban local bodies in odisha and about 4 5 years ago in fact odisha is a leader in terms of creating fecal sludge treatment plant in the urban areas even there are several other states in india despite being economically better off than uh, odisha still now they have not taken up uh, the fstp construction as seriously as odisha government has taken up so we are pioneers in uh, fstp construction in urban areas fact as on august uh, last year 52 out of the 118 fstps got completed and uh, now it is about 90 67 are functional and uh, we are hopeful that the remaining will become functional in another 5 uh, 6 months down the line therefore since there is a huge capacity created in the urban areas it becomes uh, more viable immediately start tagging up our nearby grama panchayats to these urban localities so that the services can be quickly started now to start that we need to uh, take the urban uh, department on board initially the urban department was little reluctant because uh, uh, they were skeptical as to how the operational modalities will be given that both the departments have different hierarchy and uh, the command controls are different they were little uh, reluctant as to whether the services will be effectively used or there can be some kind of a problems emerging therefore we took up baleshwar municipality as a pilot basis and we linked the, all the grama panchayats which are coming within 20 km radius as swati has explained in her uh, presentation the initial pilot went well and therefore uh, the housing and urban development department also were confident that this will uh, be scalable in all the other ulbs and now all the 114 locations we have tagged it. and we have given absolute freedom to the concerned local bodies in terms of fixing the rate each urban local body let us say x urban local body has a uh, within the urban local body a trip cost of 600 rupees there may be another urban local body within the body where the trip cost is 800 rupees we said whatever is your original trip cost within your body we will use the same amount plus there will be a top up depending on whether it is a 1 kl 1 kilo liter uh, cesspool machine traveling or 3 kilo liter cesspool machine traveling the, only the fuel cost will be added to the cesspool machines uh, original uh, rate fixed if it is 600 rupees 600 rupees plus the fuel cost now to keep it simple we said 
10 kilometer radius, 15 kilometer radius, and 20 kilometer radius, and accordingly fix the cost. We were also aware that many a times it may not be that even if it is a one kiloliter cesspool machine, the uh, volumes which are coming out from a single uh, so uh, single pit may be lesser than that. Therefore, we had allowed the consumers to even combine with their neighbors if somebody feels that the volume that they have constructed is less and uh, they are uh, paying slightly more and uh, they can utilize the services input, we can also combine with their neighbor so that the cost gets shared. And uh, accordingly, we had launched it and now the project is running successfully in all the uh, places where already FSTPs have become functional. And in the coming months, where the remaining FSTPs will become functional, we will be also uh, the 20 kilometer GPs have been already tagged. And the moment the FSTP become functional, the rural and urban areas the service will start. So we hope that uh, this will help in better utilization of the resources. In fact, under the Swachh Bharat mission, we have identified the cost now, wherein about 90 crores we can use for FSTP creation. So we had offered this 90 crore to the housing and urban development department, whereby they are under construction FSTPs. Now they will be using this 90 crore also so that the finances are shared and it becomes more uh, effective in terms of resource utilization. So I stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, sir. So uh, we request the participants to start uh, writing on the chat box. Uh, for uh, questions for the experts. Now I uh, request Dr. Al Mue uh, from Department of Public Health Engineering, Bangladesh, who has been working on fecal sludge management to uh, let us know how Bangladesh is moving towards safe management of fecal sludge in rural areas. Are they following the same pattern or is it something else they are thinking of? So over to you, Dr. Al Mue. Yeah, thank you, Shushpita Ji. Thank you, all the panelists there. And uh, I hope you can see my screen. Are you? Let me confirm, please, anyone? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, Excellent. Thank you so much. So, without any delay, I mean, let me start my presentation. And it was really encouraging to learn from your experience, uh, particularly after the speech of Paramashan Ji and uh, Swati Ji's presentation. So, what I say is the, you know, the, it's the turtle, it's my, that's my favorite character. So I would like to, you know, uh, present today about our journeys towards 2030. So it's a quite a bit, a little bit of strategic, but I tried to mix it up with the practical experiences and the blended, uh, you know, theme of the today's presentation. So, you know, a turtle has a long life and it has a, quite a good memories. Uh, okay. Uh, I think, right, right. So let's put it here. So it has a good memory. And, um, you know, <laughs> starting from the last decade, I mean, if we could go back to our rural aspects, uh, that was a, quite a beautiful, you know, aspects, uh, scenario we could get there. Very easy life. People are very, you know, uh, easily handling their regular lives. And the communication modality was quite easy. Modality was com commonly uh, with the you know boats at, at the rivers or you know the canals and uh, of course the very ancient the cart cow's cart were also there. I mean those are the common features of uh, the rural aspects of Bangladesh. And usually the you know hut or the market, what we say, we we, we found that at the bank of the river and. Uh, People came <laughs> with their goods through the boat, and uh, usually, the, you know, they uh, uh, sell and purchase the goods at the local market, which is near to the bank of the river. So this is the common scenario of the rural uh, aspects uh, for the last decade. But uh, I think uh, the stimulation or the uh, you know the inflection point uh, started soon after the present government has taken uh, its footstep after they have uh, you know in the power 
in the position in the government position after 2008 so you know uh, before going to the in between the journey of mdg i would like to highlight on the government's position when in 2018 it was reflected by the you know political manifesto of our honorable prime minister sheikh hasina to um, to have the facilities of uh, all the urban amenities that, uh, in the rural areas to expand those and uh, that was a not a dream but uh, that could be achievable and that's how we planned our you know transformation of the rural areas and uh, communications will be changed um, at the middle of the rural areas the growth centers and the you know, markets will be grown up and uh, important thing is the you know the uh, sanitation and of course the waste management of this scenario so when we um, say that the growth center and the markets uh, in the rural areas will be developed with the urban facilities that means the you know increase of the solid waste as well as the different aspects of sanitation and because there would be some public toilet which the rural areas might not fit you know see at the uh, beforehand but uh, now they would be uh, you know have those sort of facilities so for the rural areas uh, absolutely you know the rural uh, cases um, though my friend mentioned about the single pit toilet but we would like to go with the twin pit model because of the safely managed sanitation situation and of course the y junction is a common problem for everywhere uh, but i think that could be manageable with the local expertise as well i will go the discussion later and the public toilet as i mentioned is also becoming the part of the rural areas as well so the thing is the you know the rural areas are going to change have, uh, they are going to the uh, have the amenities of the urban areas uh, quite soon by 2030 of course yes so turtle is a very you know quite a good learner from the global aspect this is the situation of the you know the, in 2015 immediate after the mdg period and the beginning of the sdg period so that if you see we could find that the situation is something like that during this period what i mentioned um, that it's a learning period for us because sdg is quite new and we found that the open deflection was not at all a problem um, from the beginning of the SDG journey. Shared toilet is inevitable. It's a reality for Bangladesh. And we need to give concentration to the poor people, the lowest quintile of the you know, richest people. So, and how, how, how we can move them to the basic level, that is one part. Uh, and that has to be covered with the policy and the strategies of the Bangladesh so that uh, that could be covered from the you know, scaling up operation of the government. And uh, where we are lacking is the data management. Uh, even uh, <laughs> at present, I mean, the data, if we consider the city's data, basic level data, what is the situation of the sanitation, safely managed sanitation, particularly to be a really a uh, nightmare, I believe. The urban situation is also the similar, not so much different than, as I mentioned, and the similar sort of you know understanding. Uh, we we could convene from the last five years, I believe. So uh, ten considerations I would say that are uh, quite uh, uh, you know uh, important, and uh, this will be highlighted you know as um, uh, in my presentation today. So let's start with one by one a bit. Uh, I will touch a bit and uh, the main important points will be highlighted more with my description so the graduation as middle income countries are aspiration and uh, we are on the track and for the last few years our gdp has been quite a, quite a stable one more than seven and once uh, i mean the last eight was quite uh, you know I, uh, amidst of the COVID, though it, it, it was more than seven so it is quite uh, steady growth as i believe and which is expected that the context will be changed um, you know rural context well as i mentioned the uh, uh, my village my town as the promise of our prime minister will be also facilitated to the rural areas resources are always challenging and transparency for that national wash account that we are going to you know establish here today's presentation will not entail this uh, this i mean the national wash account and resource mobilization that will be uh, you know highlighted and described maybe some other day my friend but 
how the poor people get basic sanitation and we identified that the, these lowest quintile people i mean they are the you know uh, they should get the toilet free of cost and that's how our proposed strategy already entailed that last year we had the proposed strategy 2021 and uh, by which the poor people the lowest quintile people must get the toilet uh, at the free of cost and the SWIFE framework, uh, which is the SWIFE, that means the citywide inclusive sanitation and uh, the, you know, 150 FSTPs will be in operation within a couple of years. But one important thing we understand also that uh, we will consider the integrated waste management there. That is the, both the fecal sludge and solid waste together, not standalone fecal sludge. That is because our land is very much limited and we could not, uh, you know, get more land for the other solid waste management. So we will do it together. And data, as I mentioned, the national dashboard. Let's consider uh, one first for the SWICE framework. Maybe Shushmita Ji has mentioned that the rural and urban aspects there. Bangladesh is a critical case there. Let's say, consider this is the uh, blue line is the Upazila's boundary, whereas the municipality or Porushova is the green boundary. You see, within the area of Upazila. And uh, interestingly, Upujilas and the poor uh, municipalities headquarters or office are within the purview of the you know municipalities Porushova, where uh, the facilities of public toilet will be convened in the both uh, you know urban areas, the Porushova areas, as well as in the growth centers of the rural areas in the Upujila area. The household toilets, whatever the twin pit toilet, pit toilet, or even the you know, septic tank, those will be constructed mostly, you know, in the rural areas as well as the urban areas. And the collection of you know, mechanical emptying and fecal sludge management, it need to be expanded, not only within the municipality, but also in the area of the, you know, the uh, Upojela boundary. So uh, what uh, the government has considered um, as like you did some MOU with the ULP and Gram Panchayat. And here we have also the similar effort here that the nearby Poroshava uh, of the Upojela will uh, provide the service on behalf of the Upojela and they will extend the service to, you know, the, the periphery and up to the blue boundary of the Upojela also. So the Poroshava will be the responsible authority for the service provision of the fecal stock management and solid waste management. So, and the uh, FSTP and the integrated waste management will be in, is uh, within established within the municipality area as well. So I'm not going details, but I would, I'm very much interested to show this one also. I'll take just one minute here. Um, then, I mean, the data management, we have recently established the dashboard for the fecal sludge and solid waste management status. For the each city profile, I mean, if, if I'm just uh, requesting you to, you know, surf it later, uh, not now, but you will get uh, all the SDG indicators and everything, uh, location, all the GIS map, location, everything. Just play it with the street flow diagram. And I would also like to thank CSEs uh, for such collaboration of the C uh, with us, Bangladesh, particularly for the uh, SFD development. And you will get all these SFDs in the Su Su Susanna's website also. The Shanghai diagram, each and every details, and just play with this one, the household feature, the household the containment ratio. I mean, you will get every data of the city's profile uh, as well as, uh, I mean, the solid waste management practice, SOIS indicators, and blah, blah, blah. So this is very interesting, and I would like to request you to serve that. So this is how the data management, but but for the uh, integrated waste management, the, you know, the FSTPs that we are considered is varies with the population surface. It varies from 30,000 population to 100,000 population. So around uh, the cost will be the 0.8 million to 1.9 million USD dollar. And for each public toilet, uh, we considered about 20,000 US dollar. And for the each of the you know twine pit uh, toilet, we consider six hundred US dollar. I mean, uh, it's a very good superstructure and climate resilient superstructure uh, built on that. So that's why I mean uh, we consider that the safely managed sanitation will be excellent like that. We consider the integrated waste management like here. That means the both the solid waste and fecal sludge, and all will be gone to the one treatment plan for the further treatment, and we will do the co-composting together with the fecal sludge and solid waste when the time comes but mostly the fecal sludge uh, will be treated with this one the drying bed the planted drying bed which uh, you know uh, item wise uh, cost is also embedded here which is around 150,000 for 80,000 population coverage 
And um, you know that drying bed is there, and there will be baffle reactor constructed wetland, all will be constructed there. And we separated the solid waste into two parts. One is the combustible and the non-combustible. Non-combustible, that means organic waste that will be uh, undergone with the composting process. And the composting unit um, construction cost is around 241,000 for 80,000 population coverage. And the combustible waste, we're gonna use um, uh, some, you know, combustion unit pyrolysis gas, um, you know, uh, gasification process there. So some sort of small omniprocessor, you uh, may be aware of the omniprocessor, which is invented uh, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations. And for the small 80,000 uh, population, I mean, the cost is around, uh, uh, how, how to say, like, uh, uh, I, I, I'm gonna show it later on. But for the fecal sludge, I mean, the, all uh, the other postings I have embedded here, I'm not going details all that, but for the 80,000 population, which is around uh, 1.9 million, as I showed to you, the, all the detail costing I mentioned there. For the vehicle, as I mentioned, I mean, um, the what, how many vehicles, how, what, and uh, absolutely the operating costs, how many helpers, how many workers, all the details I have put it here so that it will be easier for you who are working at the ground. This is the model for the 80,000 population and uh, such integrated uh, waste management practice has been convened according to our policy of the institutional regulatory framework, national water supply sanitation strategy and others. So I hope that you have enjoyed my presentation and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Over to you, Shushmita Ji. Thank you, Dr. Al Muid. Now <clears throat> I would uh, request engineer Lamu to actually come up what Uganda is thinking, Engineer Lamu is the Assistant Commissioner, Planning and Development, Rural Water Supply and Sanitation Department, Ministry of Water and Environment, Uganda. So we would like to understand whether Uganda is thinking of such model of urban-rural convergence in treating the rural fecal sludge. So what is Uganda thinking? We would like to know from East Africa. Over to you, Engineer Lamu. Hello, good, good afternoon. <clears throat> Hello, do you, do you hear me? Yes, we hear okay. you. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. I have probably a five to uh, eight minutes presentation on uh, some aspects of uh, physical sludge management in rural areas in, in Uganda. Um, is my screen moving? Do you see it move? Yeah, okay. your screen is Sorry. moving. Okay. Yeah, so I uh, will look at the status of fecal sludge in Uganda, the challenges, efforts that we are uh, having in Uganda in as far as fecal sludge is concerned and some efforts to improve fecal sludge management in rural areas in Uganda. I'll skip the definitions of fecal sludge. Uh, there are approximately 8.7 million people in Uganda who have no access to sanitation as of 2020. Only 18% of the people in rural areas and 45% um, of those in urban areas in Uganda have access to basic sanitation. As, 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 as far as our report for 2020 is concerned. And poor sanitation costs Uganda about 177 million US dollars annually. Um, about 23% of the people are living in 17 of our large towns, which are under the National Water and Storage Corporation, are connected to sewerage. That's a very small percentage to compare, first of all, with the urban areas. And um, the total sewerage network in the, in, in, in the entire country is, is about 700, 700 kilometers. About 2% of the total population of Uganda is connected to sewerage. The, the, the other percentage I gave, the 23 is for urban areas only. But if you consider the entire population of the country, only about 2% is connected to sewerage. 
12%, for example, in Kampala of the households, toilets in Kampala are connected to, to the network. And there's about uh, 9,000 9, active sewer connections in Kampala alone. Kampala is a small city of about 1.5 million people. Uh, during day, of course, that population doubles to about 3 million people. And um, you can see from the square kilometers, it's, it's, it's about 14 by 14 kilometers square. That's a very small area. And of course, it's densely populated. And 60% uh, of the population live in informal settlements. Now, in urban areas here, informal settlements are not very different from, from, from rural settings, in a way. The conditions of, of living here in informal settlements in urban areas are not very different from the ones in, in rural areas. And 90% of the Kampala people rely on on-site sanitation, pit latrines and, and, and septic tanks. And more than half of the pit latrines in Kampala alone are not lined, okay? So that means that uh, the percentage is even worse for rural areas. Probably more than 70% of the pit latrines in the rural areas in Uganda are, are not lined, making it, of course, difficult to, <clears throat> to empty. Um, only about 35% of the fecal sludge produced in Kampala is collected, transported, and delivered to a fecal sludge treatment facility in, in, in Lubiji. We have a fecal sludge treatment facility with, with about 400 cubic meters per day uh, treatment capacity. Now, Kampala alone, I'm giving these urban statistics so that you, 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 you can reflect on what happens in rural areas. Currently, about 900 cubic meters of fecal sludge is generated in Kampala. Again, it's that installed capacity of 400 cubic meters. And only 44% of that can be treated. Moreover, Kampala gets an additional 150 cubic meters per day from neighboring districts those surrounding Kampala, like Iwakiso and, uh, and Mukono and so on, Biji, those districts, rural districts that uh, surrounding Kampala produce another 150 cubic per day of fecal sludge. So as a country, you, you can see we have only about 2%, 2.5% of the sanitation facilities are flush toilets and VIP latrines contribute about 9%. The rest are covered pit latrines with, with the slab and then making 20%, 32% are uh, covered pit latrines without a slab. And so you can see that the majority of the sanitation facilities we have are, are kind of on-site sanitation facilities. As a country, we produce about 74,000 cubic meters per day of fecal sludge, but the rural areas contribute only about 2,900, about 3,000 cubic meters are contributed by rural areas. Uh, currently, there are about 45 fecal sludge facilities in the country. And each of these has an average capacity of about 50 cubic meters per day. Therefore, the entire uh, total combined capacity of fecal sludge uh, treatment is just 2,250 cubic meters per day. Uh, also, you note that about half of those uh, fecal sludge facilities are designed to treat sewerage, and only one. Uh, is designed to treat both uh, fecal sludge and, uh, and, and, and other, other waste, waste matter. So our total installed capacity can only treat about 3% of the fecal sludge that is generated in the country. And uh, much of the fecal sludge that comes from rural areas 
is uh, coming from uh, institutional and public toilets, toilets in, in schools, uh, toilets in, in, in health facilities, and toilets in, in administrative units in, in the country are the ones that contribute uh, the little fecal sludge that is generated in rural areas. The rest is uh, coming from pit latrines, which are not lined. So what are some of the challenges in fecal sludge management in Uganda? Where fecal sludge facilities are available, they are often underutilized. Uh, we have experience with we, the 45 fecal sludge facilities I, I, I talked about earlier, apart from Rubiji, which is in Kampala, the rest which are in the regions and the other uh, small uh, towns countrywide, are, most of them are underutilized because uh, there's not sufficient uh, sludge to, 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 to render it operational. And therefore, it means that a lot of the sludge is uh, released into the environment, uh, either partially or uh, not fully treated. There's also low installed capacity, like I said, only 3% of the generated capacity is, 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 is installed. Then low treatment efficiencies <clears throat> for the treatment plants that we have. And like I said, some plants are not receiving or are receiving very low sludge enough to, to have the plant running. Um, again, the other challenge is that the service chain for storage, collection, and transportation of people's sludge is not well developed. Pico sludge, if you are able to empty a, a, a pit latrine or so, is mixed with solid waste, which makes treatment operations very difficult. And uh, you, you can see there that 85% of the entire country is, is, is covered, at least uh, the population, 85% of the population have have, have, have some form of pit latrine. So it's really the, 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 the dominant uh, fecal waste disposal uh, method. And less than five of the pit latrines are lined with the capacity for empty. And uh, disposal of waste, uh, many times people in, in the rural areas dispose of uh, solid waste in latrines, okay? Even biodegradable waste is, is dumped into latrines, plastics, all sorts of things are, are dumped into the pit latrines, which makes both emptying, but also once emptied, uh, makes treatment very, very difficult. We also have poor infrastructure, coupled with the lack of appropriate sludge transporting vehicles. It makes emptying and transporting of fecal sludge very, very difficult. There are cases of haulage distances, but the 17 kilometers I'm talking about here are the haulage distance, average haulage distance for, for facilities that are feeding into the, the fecal sludge facility, which is in Kampala. They are moving up to 17 kilometers on average, but in the rural areas, this 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 is even is, is even is even longer. You 20, even 50 kilometers away. Some of the regional fecal sludge facilities that have been constructed are serving maybe on average eight to ten districts. So you find if there is any possibility for emptying, uh, these cesspool emptiers are moving up to 50 kilometers to empty a, 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 a fecal sludge into fecal sludge facilities. And that makes the cost very high, uh, up to 60, 60, 60 US dollars per cubic meter to, to hire a cesspool truck to, to empty 
empty your, your fecal sludge into a fecal sludge facility. And again, this is the statistics for Kampala, where the service chain is a bit more developed than other places. Otherwise, in, in, in other rural areas, it's, it's, it's way beyond 60, 60 US dollars per cubic meter for transportation of waste. Um, regulation of fecal sludge services is, is lacking. Uh, that's the, the enforcement guidelines and the effluent discharge limits is still lacking in Uganda. Much of the focus is still on uh, which we are even still developing regulation of water services. Not much has been has been done in as far as the regulation of sanitation services is, is, is concerned. And weak institutional collaboration in fecal sludge management. As a country, we, we, we have responsibilities, three separate responsibilities in as far as sanitation is concerned. Uh, Minister of Health is responsible for sanitation in, a, in households, all households in Uganda. Minister of Education is responsible for sanitation in schools. And then the Minister of Water and Environment is responsible for sanitation in public places. And therefore, because of the expression of uh, responsibilities, there is not a very good coordinated mechanism for fecal sludge and any other form of uh, sanitation uh, services in, in the country. So well, that is a big, a big limitation. And then we have limited funds in as far as improving sanitation services to, to meet the targets of the sustainable development goals. Um, as you might be aware, you in the, uh, in the last five years, we've had an influx of refugees from neighboring countries like South Sudan and Congo, and as far as uh, Somali and, and Eritrea. And so you, you, you have a huge number of people uh, staying in a very small area in refugee settlements. And so fecal sludge is really, management is a, is a big, big problem. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees had uh, initially would, would allocate plots, very small plots for, for, for households, each household, a plot to build a house and another uh, small place to, to put up a, a latrine. And so we realized that thousands of, 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 of households living in refugee settlements, each of them with a pit latrine is not going to be a sustainable way to manage fecal sludge in refugee settlements. So we are moving away from that approach to probably uh, the approach of uh, putting up fecal sludge facilities in such concentrated settlements so that uh, we have improved uh, latrines which can be emptied and you have one central uh, fecal sludge facility somewhere so that we can reduce on the space requirement for construction of individual household pit uh, latrines. So um, what are we doing as a country? There's a national fecal sludge management baseline and study that was carried out in 2019 uh, to help <clears throat> guide the country towards um, how to approach fecal sludge management in the future. There's also the national um, fecal sludge assessment for small towns, which was carried out in 2013. Uh, actually, this assessment led to the implementation of some of the 45 fecal sludge facilities that I talked about earlier, which was done through a project here under the Ministry of Water and Environment. There's also the Kampala Master Plan, Sanitation Master Plan, <coughs> and urban sanitation implementation manual for 2015. And currently the city, city, citywide approach for sanitation, it was uh, previously meant for Kampala, but this has been rolled out and is being rolled out uh, in phases to the, uh, the other cities in, in the country to help with the sanitation management in, in urban areas. Um, of course, uh, you might want to know why I, am, I keep uh, uh, falling back into urban areas while we are talking about rural areas because it's uh, an urban area in, in Uganda 
the definition is really based on population and not based on infrastructure development. So many of the urban cities we have here are not very different from rural areas. Um, what are the efforts that we're doing in, in rural areas in specifically? As a ministry, I told you our uh, responsibility as a ministry is limited to provision of sanitation services in public places. And so uh, for households, we can only do promotion activities for purposes of ensuring that uh, households can adapt to technologies that can Okay, uh, so I think there is a small uh, net issue from the Uganda side. So we'll quickly take up a few questions uh, before uh, we finish off. So uh, we start with Orissa, Mr. Parmeswaran. So uh, there is one question which says that whether Orissa has a lab facility for the characterization and quantification of fecal sludge. Uh Presently, all the 114 FSTPs which are being designed in the urban areas, there is an inside uh, a small chemist is there in each plant. Now, I believe that this chemist is analyzing the basic parameters, which includes the coliform and other things, and uh, some. Uh, and more importantly, after the treatment, when the uh, the final compost which is getting uh, made, whether that is of usable uh, level. I believe that must be the way it is there. However, I am not personally uh, aware exactly how the, the chemist operates, what are the parameters that he studies because essentially it is the urban side. Uh, but there is a chemist who is there in each URB, each FSTP in each URB. So there is a question for uh, Dr. Al Muid also. So first of all, let me tell you all the panelists, uh, uh, the talks were highly appreciated. And so, uh, so they are asking, uh, what do you uh, do uh, about the reuse of the byproducts coming out of your FSTPs? Dr. Almuid. Well, I mean, the whole process uh, has been considered about the mass balance equation. That means uh, whatever the waste will come inside the plant, that will be treated and uh, the byproduct uh, rather i would say like the what products we can produce from there the, after the treatment so the first of all the compost product no. the compost uh, uh, which will be produced so uh, the compost which will be produced after composting from the biodecomposition of solid waste and fecal sludge mixing together. So that uh, will be, you know, uh, provided to throw the farmer's school of Hello. agriculture. Hello, Mr. Lamu, we, we are just taking a few questions and then we can uh, go to you. Yeah, please, Dr. Almuid, please. Okay. There was some net issue. Sure. So that, I mean, the compost will be distributed through the Ministry of Agriculture so that the, it will reach to the farmer for agricultural use, number one. Number two, our consideration is, uh, as you notice, that uh, also the uh, combustible waste, that means a non-biodegradable waste, which will be processed through the gasification or pyrolysis process. So there will be 4% of the ashes that we're going to receive from the combustion process. So that 4% uh, ash uh, actually, we're going to mix it together with the composting process as part of the ingredients of the, you know, the materials so that, you know, we can maintain the porosity, proper porosity. Uh, while the composting process is not undergo. So this is how we are planning not to leave the anything, um, you know, toxic uh, from inside the plant, whatever the waste will come, combustible, non-combustible, or even the fecal sludge will be treated considering the mass balance equation over. Okay. Uh, Shushita, yeah. if I may, I have one doubt with uh, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, this regarding the high water table content in Bangladesh, typically it being uh, heavily with uh, uh, the river, a uh, lot of uh, it's a low lying area. 
So the twin pit toilets that you were talking, Dr. Abdullah, what extent do we really get a dried compost matter in one of the two pits? The idea behind twin pit is that when you are using one pit, then it gets filled. Then you close it. The second pit gets used. Meanwhile, whether in one and a half years time, entirely water drains away and it becomes a hard compost kind of thing. That's a theoretical thing. But uh, we are in Odisha facing in certain, especially in the coastal Odisha, where the compliance are that the so-called twin pit really is not uh, uh, getting uh, that much dried out. So again, Bangladesh being a highly uh, a floodplain kind of area with a lot of uh, uh, river bases. So to what extent do we find that the twin pit really works in the ideal model? Um, I mean that you are absolutely right. I mean that... Um... I, I, I think that the, while you consider the joint bed, I mean, uh, particularly if you consider for the coastal belt area, so we need to raise the platform. I mean, otherwise, during the monsoon or rainy season, the flood will inundate and, you know, or the moisture can penetrate there through the bottom. But if you raised it and made it uh, with the high risk platform for the, you know, uh, coastal belt area, that will, you know, eliminate a little bit of problem. But the thing is, uh, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, I mean, uh, we didn't find uh, such a case so far as I anticipate that uh, it is uh, not uh, dried uh, after, you know, even one year or something. Usually, I mean, the size of the pit is also a, a very important issue there. Like, I'm not sure who the size of the ring that you use in Orisha, is it 750 mm or 1000 mm? Uh, can you confirm it? Do you know that the size of the ring? Uh, no, I cannot guess. Uh, okay. So, I mean, uh, again, what depth that you are going? I mean, uh, is it five ring or seven ring or 10 ring? I mean, depending upon the context of the area, where the groundwater is lowered, we, we put it that, you, you know, the eight to 10 rings, you know, underlying bottom. So where there is no possibility of groundwater pollution there, but where there is a you know, groundwater table is a little bit higher, we put at least five rings. So we don't you know, construct twine pit toilet where we cannot establish at least five rings. That means with three rings, no, no way. So at least five rings for that, uh, we need, if we need, we need to raise the you know, ground where the construction will be needed. That is one bottom line, how we can, you know, eliminate such problem as you have mentioned in reality at the ground level. Over. Uh, Mr. Parmeshwaran, I have another question for you. Uh, uh, a participant asked like, what is the strategy for timeline you have chalked out for emptying the uh, toilets? Uh, so is there any strategy so that you make your uh, model sustainable? Yeah, see, if we look at the standard protocol, it says whether it is a rural area or urban area, there should be a periodical desludging within two years or three years. But to be practical, not a single user will actually do that. I mean, who will go and desludge something when he knows that his pit is not full? Because then he has to pay the same amount of money. So even though the guideline says that there should be periodical desludging, even in urban areas, nobody does that. Now, the question is, how do we do and when do we do the desludging? Naturally, whenever the pit gets filled, whether it is a single pit or whether it is a septic tank, whenever it gets filled, immediately the concerned person registers with the Grama Panchayat Executive Officer. The Executive Officer telephonically intimates the concerned urban local body from where the cesspool machine comes and then it gets evacuated. Just one addition from Mayan Parameshwanji that I mean, usually even in Bangladesh, I mean, uh, there is, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, little places we will find that the design codes have been followed even for the septic tank or for the toilet pit. I mean, scatteredly, don't think like that. What my suggestion is, we think like that this is such nothing but a containment, a bucket. I mean, just like the ancient world, they carried the bucket, you know, that from the toilet. So it's a bucket sort of thing in the pit, in just beneath the toilet squatting hole, so that the containment can be, you know, preserved there. 
containment can be properly done there. If the containment can be done properly, don't say, <clears throat> I mean, design criteria and everything, then think about uh, how to collect the sludge from there and just put it inside the plant. I mean, this connection and this connection is important because at the field, I'm sure that you will not find any, free, I mean, the frequent discharging. No, people will not gonna do that, even though we have the same code. Again, there is little practice of code for the both the septic tanks as well as the pit also. So uh, repeat when you, the second point, please. There for the practice. design codes, for the design codes of the septic tank construction and you know the pit latrines as well. If you find that the design codes will are not followed there, if it is a contained, then fine. Let's take the slash from there and put it in the treatment plant. That's how the approach should be. I mean, the connecting yeah, the I mean, You're perfectly right. right. You're perfectly yeah. right. The idea is to contain only in terms of septic tanks. We typically ask for a twin chamber or triple chamber, ideally, so that at least the a solid matter gets contained in the first location. It will not be right. right. Then it increases the cost. There is no septic chamber. tank in Bangladesh. Unfortunately, I can mention that. I mean, septic tank is a you know engineering technical uh, you know unit. So it, even the engineering aspect, the decomposition that should be happened in the first chamber, it's not happening because of the, you know it is not at all a septic tank. So if it is a containment, I am quite happy. <laughs> Yeah, there are there are problems with the with the designing of uh, uh, yeah twin pits as well as septic tanks. It's actually happening to be the holding tanks. So, Mr. Lamu, are you there? Uh, Mr. Lamu, okay. So the net issue. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, Mr. Lamu, we have a question actually uh, from Uganda itself, talking about what you are thinking of the uh, slum areas. Slum areas. What what are your plans for the slum areas? Uh, uh, slum areas, we, we, we have some uh, NGOs and the other organizations that are, are helping, especially with the improving sanitation in, in slum areas. I, I, I have one example of Water for People that has been um, involved in developing the Galpa for emptying some of the sanitation facilities in, 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 in slum areas. So our approach is basically to, to, to create an environment where the private sector can uh, provide facilities, say the emptying of these uh, sanitation facilities, on-site sanitation facilities in, in slum areas and deliver this waste into the fecal sludge management facility. Okay? Okay. So uh, one more last question. Um, Swati, you can take this up. So uh, what is your uh, experience when uh, there, there are no small towns near the villages which has a FSTP? What, what are your uh, research findings telling? Was that for Swati? This was for Swati. From Swati to me? No, no, Swati is to... Uh, okay, I'm fine. Uh, so uh, we had a case in uh, Dur Chhattisgarh and we have a few examples from Karnataka as well. They have uh, developed cluster FSTPs. So a group of uh, villages come together and uh, they, develop, they have developed FSTPs, but uh, the sustainability and the model yet uh, remains to be validated. And uh, uh, I, I, I wish if Ravi can... Uh, share his experience uh, from Karnataka on, on this part, uh, if he has uh, something. Uh, you okay. okay. You Fine. Uh, so yeah, so basically uh, my experience uh, from the field says they have, uh, they are still in the development phase and not a lot, not lot of examples, but a few uh, that exist uh, have come up with uh, rural FSTPs in case where there are no towns uh, nearby. Uh, 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 an example of Nagar Palika Durg that I shared, they have planned uh, FSTP on the Nagar Palika land and they have clustered the nearby villages. So, uh, so Odisha was basically the uh, existing FSTPs were converged with rural areas here with uh, Raipur Durg. They are actually planning 
on both the ends they are also uh, planning clustered fstps and they are also planning with the uh, urban areas and they are developing fstps so i hope i could answer the question thank you And you have to unmute, ma'am. We are not able to hear. So, Smita, you your phone is muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Yeah. So we have already crossed the time. So thank you, eminent panelists. And we actually, uh, the main aim of this meeting was to understand how sustainable is the urban rural convergence. So we have heard from Orissa that they are running the sustainable urban rural convergence. And uh, we have seen from Bangladesh also they are moving on uh, this line only uh, to actually make uh, the uh, area uh, rural areas and the peri urban areas cl clustered together. So uh, yeah, um, uh, Uganda is facing some issues, some issues, but they are also uh, planning to tag in few of the rural areas uh, near Kampala. But for others, they are thinking of new FSTPs. Uh, so th uh, this is the case in India also. Uh, we have seen in Kadataka where we have seen a cluster of villages stacked together to one FSTP. So with this, I end our uh, webinar here, but we actually uh, request all the participants to write in to us uh, to, um, you know, if you have any other question and all the uh, recordings will be uploaded with the presentation. Uh, with this, we end the webinar here. Have a good day and uh, be safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye.